I'm Laura Vinroot Poole. For over 20 years, I've owned Capital, an internationally recognized specialty store in Charlotte, North Carolina. On this podcast, we unlock the stories of people's lives through the stories of what they wore. These aren't conversations about fashion. These are conversations about people. Nick Piquet is dashingly handsome, highly sought after for his namesake hat collection, and surprisingly very shy. I love sitting down with Nick on a recent trip to Los Angeles and learning more about the many moments of kismet that brought him to this point in his career. Nick Piquet, (laughs) (laughs) I'm so happy to see you. I'm I'm so happy to be in California with you. Yeah, me too. It's great to see you, of course. And I'm particularly excited about our exclusive that you have for us for the new store in Brentwood. Yeah, me too. I'm really excited. Yep. It's going to be fun. <laughs> you make the world's most beautiful hats. Thank you. That's really <laughs> kind of you. Where are you from? I was born in New York City. At the age of one, my family moved to the southwest of France, where my father's from. I lived there until I was like six or seven. And French What is... part? You said southwest? Southwest is a town called Royan, which uh-huh. is an hour away from Bordeaux. Got it. And then when I was six or seven, my family moved to Florida. And then I spent like my grade school years from like first grade to eighth or ninth grade in Florida, in Palm Beach, Florida. Uh And then I got sent away to boarding school in the Northeast and kind of skipped around to a couple. You're one of six siblings? Yeah, yeah, I have five sisters. Five sisters and you're the only boy and where are you in the mix? Well, in the middle, I have two two younger and three older. And tell me about your dad. Well, so my dad is a professional male model. He's the silver fox. He's he just is looks good all the time. You, you know? look a lot like him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I age like him because he looks great. Yeah. He's also like the coolest guy, and he's like my best friend. So he was modeling when you were in France. Yeah, I mean, pretty much he's been modeling like his whole life. I think he took like a break when he was with my mom, and we were living in Florida for about like eight nine years. And then when he like came back into the business, it was sort of like a, a at a time where. Like that demographic, age demographic wasn't was in demand, but there like wasn't many guys in that category. Yeah. So for like the longest time, my dad was like running the older male <laughs> model category, which is hilarious. And so from France, would he get a job in, in all over the world? Like the world. you know, for the longest time, he was like the Brooks Brothers guy, and then he was huh. like the Tommy Hilfiger guy for like six, seven years each. That's so interesting. And so, did you go on shoots with him or? Yeah, I went on a couple, like, you know, after I graduated college and stuff. Like, we, you know, sometimes you'd be like, hey, this magazine, like, needs, like, the father-son thing. Like, and that's how, like, I, you know, that's sometimes I, like, did some work with them. But And what was that like? It was weird, you know? It was just like, it, but, you know, the thing is, is, like, because I, I met so many cool people via that 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 industry because I like dabbled in it for like a hot minute but um um you know there's there's it's funny because the job of modeling is like the most uncreative thing you can do right you're just like sitting there and waiting and just not but, in your control yeah but Almost. also like you go there like the photographer the stylist the hair and makeup they're all doing creative things and you know you're always like looking at them being like man they're doing like cool stuff and right they're, like they're just sitting like you know, oh, and it, yeah. and so, but the people you meet are so cool. But it's definitely my my father's like style and aesthetic that 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 sort of drove me to do what I do. And what was his? Thing. What's his style like? I mean, I think he's almost like a mix of of East Coast prep with like French countryside with like a you know bit of like California, I guess. But you remember any piece of clothing? That you like remember? my dad, I just like yeah, he's his khaki khaki pants game is super strong like, <laughs> flat front or pleated flat front although i Unless do love the, the 80s, pleated yeah. look but yeah i do like the pleated look a lot especially right now and tell me about your mom yeah my, my mom's from new york from the city and also grew up in long island in oyster bay and long island, all that what's area. her style like her interior decorating style i'm sorry if my mom hears this it's like horrible <laughs> it's like embarrassing but her her personal like clothing style is it's great. I mean, my mom is such a beautiful woman that like she could wear anything and yeah. looks good. But yeah. any memories of that of them going out or well, you know, like East Coast and like my mom was like sort of in the social. She's you know socialite socialite circle back back in the day more, and so you know they go to these events and dress up, and it was always like, you know, looking thinking about it and looking back, it was always really cool to see them like. 
you know, getting dressed, ready yeah. to go out to like an event in Palm Beach or in Long yeah. Island or in the city. So it was always, it always looked cool. It always looked like they were going to go out to have fun. Well, because I, I feel like I'm always recreating my parents, these looks of theirs in the 70s when they would go out. Same thing. And my mother had this beautiful one shoulder red, sort of like a orangey red Halston gown. Wow. And yeah. just seeing them and just being like, oh, this is this is everything to me. My mother was so beautiful and it's yeah. so beautiful. Yeah, and I think when you're young, you look at your parents and they're like the archetype of, of yeah. beauty or the ar- archetype of like style and and it's definitely plays a huge impact, you know, on and it, it did for me for sure. And then what was it like so going from from Florida to Connecticut boarding school? What did you do you remember what, what did you wear? Oh what man, <laughs> and you know what? That was actually a really cool, interesting time because so I got sent away, you know, my ninth grade year to a place in Massachusetts called Brooks, and I remember uh, mandatory jacket and tie. Yeah. And then there was like this crew of kids that would wear like patchwork pants and jacket <laughs> and like herringbone, Punk like rock. and kind of like like really funk it up. And I was like, man, this is really cool like bow ties right yeah. like oh we're not gonna wear ties we're, you know if you're gonna wear a tie like wear a bow tie <laughs> yeah. so it was like they're almost like this dandy aspect that was going on there that that like when I think about it was like super cool so I ended up sort of like spicing up that my style <laughs> like kind of by and, by chance and almost like the first time that you really conscientiously got into your style or something yeah definitely I think that was like a big that was like a, one of those turning points for sure yeah and so then after two boarding schools? Yeah, two boarding schools. <laughs> then I got sent away to an all-boys boarding school. I, 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 got, I got asked to leave. <laughs> asked not to come back? Asked, asked, well, no. no I, got, I just got kicked out in September. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. It's traumatic. And so I went back. Oh, yeah, I went back to Florida for, like, the rest of the semester. No private school would take me in the middle of the semester. So I went to this, like, public school in, like, South Florida. And it can get pretty it was pretty tough it was like that was like going from like a (laughs) preppy boarding school to like (laughs) literally like it was dangerous minds yeah (laughs) i'm not even kidding it was like one you know because florida high schools are like rough so so then my family was like okay well now you got to go back to um we're sending you back to boarding school and they had ties with this with this all boys school called salisbury and then you went to college and then tell me what you did after college I mean, I traveled a lot. I really traveled extensively during, you know, I went to school out and co- I went to college out here and, and, I, and I left after like nine months. I went to the school called University of Redlands, which I like was really weird. And so, <laughs> I, and so again, I was in this like transitory moment and I ended up staying in Topanga. I was yeah. like, it's funny oh, wow. to think about that. Yeah. Like for the where whole summer now? where I live now. And, and I was talking to my dad's best friend who's now like a 60 year old techno DJ. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, man, I, I can't go back to that fucking school. Like, it's just like, and he was like, dude, you need to like go travel. And so yeah. at 18, I ended up going to Patagonia for like six months. And that was like, and, and why Patagonia? How did you well, just like, you know, my parents were divorced, like things were kind of hectic back home and like I didn't know where to go and there was like really no direction. So I remember just like asking my mom if I could like borrow her credit card just to like get something <laughs> and I ended up buying a ticket and <laughs> and then like was down there for about like three, four, four or five months and, and meeting up with an organization down there all whilst doing that called uh, Knowles, which is oh, not, no, I did a Knowles semester. You did, yeah. yeah. I dropped out of college and did a Knowles semester too. Yeah, we got a lot of cro- we, we got a lot of common. It's crazy. It's the East Coast. Nick. It's that, yeah. And that was that was that, pretty life changing. It changed my life too, completely. It did, right? Truly. Yeah. So I, I went down to Patagonia and I was like, "What the fuck did I get myself into?" And it was really tough for the first couple of weeks, and then yeah. you get so accustomed to it, oh. and you're like. It's, I mean, hard, it's hard to come back. I mean, I, I couldn't sleep in bed. It was after. the best thing, one of the best things that I've ever done in my life, for Same sure. Here. Same for here. sure. I remember with something that I still use to this day was like one of my like teachers there. I'd be like complaining about something, and he'd tell, keep telling me like, "Give me solutions, not problems." Yes. And it's something like still I to this that. day I tell my team when they're like, "There's like problems." Like oh, I'm like, "Just give me solutions. I don't yeah. care about the fucking problem." Yeah. And then after <laughs> that, came back out to California. No, then after that, I, I ended up living in New York in, in the city for like a year and a half. And, you know, I was there in 2006 or 2007. And it was super 
not my temperament to sort of like go to, to New York. And what happened was like really by accident. I went there and I ran into like an old friend that was a couple years older. And she was like, what are you doing here? And I don't know why. I was like, oh, I'm looking. Yeah. She was like, you should come down. We like need a roommate. We're in Chinatown. And this is Chinatown 2006. Yeah. And, and I was like, yeah, sure. And then not thinking about it, she actually called me the next day. And I was like, okay, I'll go check it out. Not thinking I would live in New York because it wasn't yeah. really... I don't, it was no wanted. interest for me. Yeah, I like, yeah. wanted to live by the beach. I didn't even know what I was doing. I, you know, after college, you're like, what the yeah. fuck am I going to do with my life? Yes. What'd you, what was your major? Environmental science and okay. sustainable development. I, I, I ended up going to see this apartment, which was in Chinatown, and it was like 2,500 square feet and like old school <laughs> elevator shaft. I think for my rent was going to be like $800 a month. Uh-huh. And I was overlooking the East River. Cool. And I was like, man, I. I just intuitively knew, like, this is never going to happen again, <laughs> and I should just do it. And it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was like kind and of like a do? Friends episode. It was like <laughs> one of the girls worked at Ralph, the girl I knew worked at Ralph Lauren. The other girl was a model, and my, the guy was like ran a club or a bar. And what did you do? I worked for, at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up working at the bar. <laughs> How did hats come about? Hats came about really later. I mean, it was like actually when I transitioned to to California because after New York, I then I moved to Colorado. But after Colorado, I came down to California, and I was trying to figure out, you know, what I wanted to do. And I and during that whole time, I was always like, even when I was in New York or wherever I was, like super into style and clothing and fashion, yeah. which. You know, at the time, being like a straight male was like kind of weird, but yeah. like I just had always had gravitated well, towards it because of my father. Yeah, exactly. And so I ended up working for a designer out here whose name's Christophe, who has this store called Mr. Freedom, which is on Melrose Place, and he does reproduction World War Two and, and cool. sort of like yeah. And so a lot of those brands like Abercrombie and J Crew and Ralph would like go there yeah. to get inspiration because he had a bunch of like a huge vintage section but he also made his own stuff so I ended up working for him and mm-hmm. and you know it was this French guy and he was like hey just if you want to work you can work up sort of like in the production area and you can sort of work on the the industrial sewing machines and help like they were making a lot of one-off stuff which was like one-off jackets with like vintage fabric that was dead stock from like you know the south of france like some linen and all the stuff so i ended up making like suspenders and caps and jackets and i was and i was you know i was getting paid like nothing but it was like man i was like going to school learning and i was like i fell in love with it i was like this is so this is amazing and so ultimately after a couple years working there on and off i was like yeah i want to do my own thing i don't know what that was i had no idea and one day while i was working there I wore, ran into this cowboy, the, this like Western, you know, cowboy guy wearing like this super, super cool hat. And I was like, whoa, where'd you get that hat? It's so amazing. And he explained to me that he'd actually physically made it. And I was like, how does one do that? Well, how right. does one do that? And, <laughs> you know, while I was thinking of what I wanted to do, I was like, denim's oversaturated. T-shirts are oversaturated. Shirts are oversaturated. And everything I was like thinking about in that marketplace was Nobody just like. does hats. Yeah, and then back in the, back in, during that time, there was Borsellino and Stetson, and eventually Borsellino I was yeah. doing designs for. Well, I was like, well, who, who, how do you do this? Who does this? He's like, there's 30 hat makers in America that do this this one way, hmm. and they're mostly in like, you know, Texas and and Montana and Salt Lake City, hmm. and there's maybe 300 that do it block in this certain way. And I was like, what's blocking? What's the, what are you talking about? But I I knew from working with Kristoff that like. How to how to how to sew how to right. how to use that but the whole like felting and hat making yeah. part was like super foreign but I was just like well if thirty people in America do this I was like this is un, un, you know under this isn't like this is undersaturated let's right. do this <laughs> this is in peril so it was like a, a treasure hunt to find old equipment you know old blocks that were like you know fifty sixty years old and learning how how that went and and so did you keep in touch with this guy he en- eventually ended up passing away. Uh. But it sounds like he was generous with you and sharing kind of... Yeah, I mean, like, we came together. We both had, like, our strength, strengths. But, you know, it was, it was you know, really early on. And, and, and unfortunately, it just, like, didn't work out. Uh-huh. And we also had, like, creative differences. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't want to just make, like, Western, like, cowboy hats that... Ever, all those. I wanted to do something different. Because at that time, I was looking at Borsellino and Stetson. And it was... The hat hadn't changed in, like, 80 to 100 <laughs> years. It was... Black hat, black girl grain, like silver hat, silver girl grain, right. and on and on and on. 
And I was like, how do we modernize this? How do we make it a little bit more interesting and a little bit more like fashion yeah. for rather than just like, oh, this is, you know, I still have my grandfather's hat. Did you go ever to one of those, to one of the hat making places in Texas or um, Well, I went to Italy and I went oh, to, to, the, Borsalino. Oh, yeah, yeah. to the Borsalino factory who I ended up working with for a couple of seasons. And I um, mean, that, that's like a 150 year old factory. So they have like the same, wow. same. Yeah. In uh, Rome? It's called in, it's north of Milan and a oh. town called, I forget it, but they call it Spinetta. Spinetta. That was pretty amazing fascinating yeah it was like i mean it was like for me it was like a dream it's like kind of such an iconic brand and asking me to to come in and and help you know design some some pieces and do a collection was like it was really really cool do you remember the first hat you made do you still have it i definitely i definitely don't (laughs) but i do i do yeah the matches was like from the from the inception yeah yeah yeah, but and, I don't remember. <laughs> and what's it been like running your own business? It's been like a real how like, to explain it. Just do you sort sometimes of like, feel like you want to run off to Patagonia? <laughs> yeah, more like a visa. <laughs> I love it, you know, and I really wouldn't have it any other way. I realize, but you know, when they say blood, sweat, and tears, it's like literally been all those things. I mean, I make things with my hand. Like yeah. it's been, it's been so. It's like blood's been there, tears <laughs> have been there. So it's all been there, and it's been challenging, but so rewarding as yeah. well. And I'm so so grateful. And it's a practice, and almost like it's just been like a spiritual practice. You know, I've like learned so much about myself. Absolutely. And that's been been really interesting. And it's been it's been making me push myself in places where like kind of a very introverted person and so it's almost been like okay I'm not good at managing teams at all it's like learning okay you got you have to do this somebody's got to yeah and like now it's kind of changed where it's like I don't have to do that as much (laughs) but early on you kind of have to do everything and there's things you don't want to do and say no you know like to people or like turn things away or fire people and you know, it's stuff like I, you don't want to do, but you have to do in well, order to grow the think, business. I was going to say, I also think it's important to have done. I mean, I, for me, I, I did absolutely do everything. I, I worked by, by myself in every, for the entire, you know, buying, selling, all of it. Only salesperson in the store for the first two years. I would never trade that because I do, I do know how every job should be done. I know other people do it a ton better than I could. For sure. But I think just knowing what's required of it and really understanding. I what totally it means. agree. But I think more than ever today, I'm just like, okay, remember to like stop, smell the roses, and like have fun, you know? Because yeah. you can get so into that zone where you're just like, and I'm in it right now where I have to like create and come up with ideas and be with my team, and then I'm like, you know, like going. Taking like breaks is is huge because I think for the first two years I you literally did. worked seven days a week <laughs> yeah. for two years. Yeah, if you could design a hat for anybody alive or dead, who would it be? What's well, uh, it's funny because <laughs> I've been so fortunate. Like every person that I've wanted to make a hat for, like I ended up really making <laughs> one for. You know, like I, like we just you know had Axl Rose. Oh my god! Or, and then we had Keith Richards. Like a no! couple months. Like we but like and then it's like. Or it's been just like it's. I've been so fortunate. So every person, I'm like, oh my god, like I would just like, wait, and it, it's it's mostly happened. So it's you like I've like had to like all. raise the bar, and I was like, <laughs> okay, it's gonna be the Dalai Lama next, or it's gonna be like the Pope. He would look so good in a hat. Yeah, I know, but that's like. <laughs> And that's, do a new what are the what are the Pope's hats called? Oh my god, I, I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. But you like you yeah, <laughs> that's that's where that's where I'm like go, going now. So it seems like you have in your life you have all these moments of kismet all these you know you fall sort of follow your nose and fall into this thing that becomes this thing and why do you why do you think that happens for you like what are you doing that's allowing that to happen you must really listen to your gut yeah i do i really listen to my gut i mean it's kind of weird to to say but you know i i think it comes from it has to come from the gut and i feel and some people are just like that i've been like really fortunate and just, just had like um just a lot of luck you know but like always been like kind of prepared for it and and 
And so it's been sort of like... Well, I don't even know that it's luck. It's like just expecting the right thing to happen. It might be like ignorant, but just always like positivity towards it, you know? I mean, come on. When I started making hats, like people were like, what the fuck are you doing? This is like (laughs) crazy. Like you're going to like sell really high-end luxury hats. You're like working in a garage basement. And my gut was just like... I just, I need to see it through. I remember having like, you know, like $4,000 in the bank account to run this business and yeah. like, you know, had the opportunity to go up on a bikini and I was, or, or I was like, I knew I just had like three, four, five months to survive. And, and, and so I just, I just trust my intuition and, you know, I don't want to sound too like West Coast spiritual, but I just like believed like, okay, I have a higher power and like, yeah. this is what's up and I just have to 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 trust it you know and have, see it through have you had mentors along the way or people i mean have your parents been supportive and totally i mean you know it, it, i've been so lucky that i have some so many amazing people like on my side that have helped me whether and you know when it comes to mentors like i have a bunch of mentors in different different sectors you know whether it's like business or or, or love or life and yeah. and my family were you know my father was like super supportive and i think my mom was like don't, do you need to go to business school? Like, she was almost like, what are you doing? Like, we'll send you to, to business school. I'm like, what, so we're going to spend like $300,000 here and I'm going to come out. But also, like, you don't need to go to business school if you've, I mean, running a business as you have and as I have. I you couldn't like go to business school and yeah. come out with like <laughs> an MBA from like, you know, it's like what, in case study. And like, they're exactly. never going to be like, what happens when like someone comes drunk to work? What are you going to do? <laughs> you know, there's things that you just like, and that's what like, I realize, like, I'm also someone that just learns that 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 just has to do it. Like, I do too. I, I could like well, that's read a book thing. on like driving a car and like <laughs> memorize it, but it's just like throw me the keys, put me behind the wheel, like yeah. I'll figure it out. I'm a total experiential learner. I yeah, mean, I, I have to do it. You could tell me everything. You know, this is this will hurt you. I'm like, well, I need to see if it will. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. need to try. Yeah. What do you think the ingredients have been for your success? I mean, I think. The ingredients have been like to keep a really like an open mind. Traveling has been has been a huge ingredient for me because like we were saying earlier, it's really allowed me to like look at things from the outside in differently. Because when you're in the middle, uh, you know, being like working like seven days a week for two two years straight, and you know, you need to to get a little bit of perspective. And mm-hmm. so that's been a that's been a huge in- ingredient for me, yeah, creatively as well. But I think going out outside mm-hmm. and being in nature as much as possible is like is super is super key. Are you a hiker still? Yeah, I hike. I do. <laughs> I mean, I like. I, yeah, I like to be in the ocean more. Yeah. You, know? you surf? I do. I surf. I surf a little, and and I just like to take like road trips and get out and, Same. and see different places. You've been interviewed a lot. Is there anything that you've not been able to share that people don't know about you that you would want people to know about you? Yeah, believe it or not, I'm like just like really, really shy, yeah. and and like when I get put into circumstances, situations where I have to sort of like perform, like I do it, but like I'm like a, I'm kind of like an introvert, and like that's just hard. Like really that's hard. Shy. It's hard in being in sales. I mean, and selling yourself essentially, you know, because I yeah, but then you just have, that's when like you become sort of like an actor. You have to like play yeah. the role and. I mean, I just, you know, I just want to be, like, at my place in Topanga with, like, <laughs> my dog and, like, my fruit trees. And, 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 like, that's, that's, like, I'm kind of, like, a recluse a little bit. On every podcast we ask at the end, what did you wear to prom? I didn't go to prom. <laughs> at, the boys, at the boys' school, I don't think you went to prom, right? <laughs> at Salisbury, yeah, did they exactly. have a prom? They 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 did not. No. Not that I remember. What would you have worn? I would have maybe worn like a baby blue tuxedo. Yes. That would look good. Yeah. With the ruffles? <laughs> With the ruffles for sure. <laughs> I guess it's a little like dumb and dumber style, but like it, I would have made it look <laughs> yeah, pretty you, pretty cool. You would have made it look great. Yeah. Thank you, Nick, so much. Thank you so much for having me. What We Wore is produced by Capital and Balto Creative Media. The original song, Someone So Enchanting was composed and performed by Britt Drazda. What We Wore is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. 
Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com.